So what we're going to do today is continue our exploration of Nostra Aetate, but focus particularly on paragraph four, which we will read closely together for the first hour. We'll have a coffee break at around half past 10. We'll take a break for, let's say, about 20 minutes. And then we will come back together and we will have a guest, a Jewish friend of mine by the name of Dr. David Lubinsky. Grant should have started by what I'm going to say now, which is Shana Tova. <laughs> okay, meaning Happy New Year, because the last two days were the Jewish New Year. And we're in a very, very important period in the Jewish calendar. In a few days' time, it will be Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and then just after that, the Feast of Tabernacles. So it's a very propitious time to be talking about our relationship with our Jewish brothers and sisters. And we will have time after David answers some of my questions, hopefully at some length, questions I've given him, and I'll share those questions with you at the end of this morning's session. Um, there will be time also to pose questions to him. I say immediately, David is a very, very open person willing to take any question, okay? As silly as you might think it is, as challenging as you might think it is, please don't be embarrassed to ask. Okay? So, let's begin. We're going to start with, like last time, a piece of music or a chant, El Male Rahamim, which in Hebrew means God full of mercy. It is a wonderful cantor from New York who is singing this at Ground Zero in New York during the visit of Pope Francis. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for a prayer for the fallen. Yastirem 
the Seiter can have a So, I think a very moving prayer to begin with. At the end, the prayer was, the one who is on high, may he make peace. And I think that we really need that prayer as we think about what's going on in the Middle East, in Palestine, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Israel, in Lebanon, Iraq, Iran, Syria. May he make peace. So, again, our program for today, my input, a coffee break, and then a discussion with Dr. David Lubinsky that will fill our morning today. So let's dive in. We are talking about today that specific paragraph, the longest paragraph in the entire document that talks about dialogue with the Jewish people. And again, if we think back to last week, for those that were here or might have seen the video that is uh, on YouTube, we talked about the context of Nostra Aetate and mentioned, and this is of particular importance for the text that we're about to read, the Shoah, what happened during the Second World War to the Jewish people, the discovery after the war that the Nazis had tried to wipe the Jewish people off the face of the earth. And many, many Christians and many Catholics waking up to what they had contributed to a discourse of contempt for the Jewish people, portraying them as God killers. Yes, because they were responsible for crucifying Jesus, and we believe that Jesus Christ is God. They had killed God. But worse than that, after having killed them, there was no repentance and they continued in their rejection of Jesus, blind, ignorant, and of course, rejected by God. The people who had been chosen by God was now rejected by God. We call this the discourse of contempt or the teaching of contempt. 
and Nostra Aetate would turn this teaching around to promote a teaching of respect, and that's what we want to examine today. The photograph that we see there is a particularly moving photograph because the old cardinal sitting there, his name is Augustin Beyer, a German, and I add with pride, a Jesuit, a great biblical scholar who was really at the cutting edge of bringing the document together and as a German and as a Catholic, particularly aware of how things had to change with regard to our discourse about the Jewish people. The man sitting next to him is probably one of the greatest Jewish teachers in the 20th century, certainly among the greatest. His name was Abraham Joshua Heschel, a great commentator on the Bible, a theologian and a philosopher, who agreed to go and meet Cardinal Beyer, to meet Pope Paul VI, with a lot of hesitation, but he went. And then when the dialogue began, when he read the text of Nostra Aetate, he took it on with his two hands and became the leading voice in a Jewish world that was hesitant about engaging with Christians because of the dialogue of contempt, the discourse of contempt that had created for too many Jews in too many places a hell on earth. So, again, a memorable photograph. Let's start reading the document. Okay, and we're really, we're going to read this long paragraph. I'm going to read it slowly so it can really sink in. Um, somebody who read it, Landy, came this morning having read it and she said, it's really a beautiful text and I agree. I think it's an inspired text. It begins, as the sacred synod searches into the mystery of the church, it remembers the bond that spiritually ties the people of the new covenant to Abraham's stock. Let's pass that so that it's clear. The sacred synod is, of course, this meeting, Vatican II, the bishops all coming together, thousands of bishops around the Pope. And as that meeting, the leaders of the church look into what is the church, the mystery of the church, right there, and this makes the relationship with the Jewish people particular, unlike relationship with anyone else, right when we are considering who we are as church, it is there that we remember how we are tied to the Jewish people, the spiritual ties that tie us to the stock of Abraham. Thus, the Church of Christ acknowledges that according to God's saving design, the beginnings of her faith and her election are found already among the patriarchs, Moses and the prophets. So, of course, that's not new to us. Our story begins way before Jesus. It begins with the beginning of humanity and then in a particular way with the calling of Abraham. That is where we are one with the Jewish people in our memory. She professes that all who believe in Christ, Abraham's children according to faith, are included in the same patriarch's call and likewise that the salvation of the church is mysteriously foreshadowed by the chosen people's exodus from the land of bondage. Of course here, okay, and we do have Jewish friends present. We can later ask also David when he comes. This idea of when Christ comes, the election is stretched, is broadened to include all those who believe in Jesus, who become one with Israel as the people of God. The church, therefore, cannot forget that she received the revelation of the Old Testament through the people with whom God, in his inexpressible mercy, concluded the ancient covenant. Nor can she forget that she draws sustenance from the root of that well-cultivated olive tree 
unto which have been grafted the wild shoots, the Gentiles. Now, for those that are not completely familiar with the Bible, hopefully many of you will identify what the text is talking about. In the Epistle to the Romans in chapter 11, St. Paul gives a wonderful image. It's the image of two olive trees. One of them is a domesticated olive tree that gives fruit. That is Israel, fed by the Spirit of God. The other is a wild olive tree that does not give fruit. Those are the Gentiles. I say it brutally that we recognize what an incredible change is taking place here. Notice that according to St. Paul, what happens when Christ comes is that branches from that wild olive tree are grafted onto the domesticated olive tree so that they too can be fed by the Spirit of God. Okay, Paul continues, and this is the difficult part, that those who don't believe in Christ are cut off from the tree and fall to the ground. That, of course, is a difficult part in the dialogue with our Jewish brothers and sisters. But then Paul insists their place is saved for them because at the end of time, all will be part of that olive tree. And we'll come to that in a moment. But it's important to identify here a text that has become an incredible resource in the reworking of our relationship with the Jewish people, a text that was largely overlooked. We use lots of other texts in order to teach contempt. Now, looking for respect, we found these chapters, chapter 9, 10, and 11 of the Epistle to the Romans, that have a completely different look on the Jewish people and appreciation for the Jewish people in the writings of St. Paul. The text continues, Indeed, the church believes that by his cross, Christ, our peace, quotation from the epistle to the Ephesians, reconciled Jews and Gentiles, making both one in himself. Again, a powerful text in the second chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. Christ is our peace. On the cross, he created a new human person, and the division between Jews and Gentiles was healed. Okay, let's continue with the text. The church keeps ever in mind the words of the apostle, that's the apostle Paul, about his kinspeople, his kinspeople being the Jewish people. Paul is Jewish. And this is what he writes at the beginning of chapter 9. Theirs, the Jewish people, theirs is the sonship or the childhood. Notice I didn't correct all of this gender insensitive language. Theirs is the childhood and the glory and the covenants and the law and the worship and the promises. Theirs are the fathers and mothers. Count them up. Notice, and I think it's deliberate. There is seven there. Let's go through them. The childhood, they are children of God. They see the glory. They have the covenants, notice the plural, the law, the worship, the promises, and the patriarchs and matriarchs. Seven is a fullness, a perfection of blessings. And then, of course, Paul adds the eighth, the overflow and from them is the Christ according to the flesh, the son of the Virgin Mary. Again, it's almost a mystery. How could Christians have forgotten the Jewish identity of Jesus and of Mary? A joke. We're in a refectory of a group of religious I won't give a national identity to this group of religious, but speaking the old language of contempt about the Jews. What a blind people. They killed our Lord. They continue to be blind, ignorant, trying to control the world. And suddenly they hear voices. 
and they look up. And it's Jesus on the crucifix talking to the icon of Our Lady. And he says to Our Lady, Mom, they don't like us here. Come on, let's get up and go. <laughs> she also recalls, the church also recalls, that the apostles, the church's mainstay and pillars, as well as most of the early disciples who proclaimed Christ's gospel to the world, sprang from the Jewish people. Again, for so many centuries, we thought that they were all a group of Polish, Irish, God knows what. We forget uh, that they were Jewish. And now we come to the absolute center of this paragraph, and it's here that we have the most stunning change in discourse. As Holy Scripture testifies, Jerusalem did not recognize the time of her visitation, nor did the Jews in large number accept the gospel. Indeed, not a few opposed its spreading. Now, we all know that part. That's the part that was the basis of the teaching of contempt. The Jews, the overwhelming majority, rejected Jesus. But now the document continues to open up a new horizon, a teaching of respect. Nevertheless, God holds the Jews most dear for the sake of their patriarchs and matriarchs. And the sentence that comes from Paul once again, he does not repent of the gifts he makes or of the calls he issues, such is the witness of the apostle. Now let's say a few words about that because I think that this is the very kernel of the change in discourse. By the way, this very verse has constituted a refrain in all of the documents that came afterwards and all of the times that the popes addressed relationships with the Jewish people. What did we used to say? We used to say, the Jews rejected Jesus. So God rejected them. That was the real core, the heart of the teaching of contempt. We recognize that once they had been chosen, but now they aren't anymore because they rejected Christ. So God rejected them. What a ridiculous theology. As though God follows what we do. The good news is the very good news that God does not go back on God's promises, that God is faithful no matter what. Without that good news, where would we be? If we looked at our own history and saw how many times we have rejected God, thank God God is faithful. And again, I say this is the very center of paragraph four. He does not repent of the gifts he makes or of the calls he issues, such is the witness of the apostle. A quotation from Romans chapter 11, verse 29, again repeated as a refrain ever since 1965. I think never once quoted in the centuries before then, when we preach that God is unfaithful. In company with the prophets and the same apostle, the church awaits that day known to God alone on which all peoples will address the Lord in a single voice and serve him shoulder to shoulder, a quotation from the prophet Zephaniah, again essential to the new teaching, because there is today no missionary body in the church that preaches Jesus Christ to the Jews. Does that mean that we do not hope one day that Jews will be, believe like we do? We do hope that. But we do not exert any pressure. We do not go out to preach on street corners because, notice again the wording, a day known to God alone when we will work to walk together as one people. A completely new idea of relationship with the Jewish people, a relationship of respect. Okay, the document continues. 
since, and this will, these will be the consequences, the rest of the document are the consequences, since the spiritual patrimony common to Christians and Jews is thus so great, this sacred synod wants to foster and recommend that mutual understanding and respect, which is the fruit above all of biblical and theological studies, as well as of fraternal and what's the sororial, sororitorial dialogues. Now, I want to dwell on this statue, okay? This statue is a very new statue inaugurated by Pope Francis when he visited the Jesuit University in Philadelphia, St. Joseph's University. And I want to pass the statue because it's a wonderful image of this new discourse. In medieval times, there were statues and icons spread all over Europe. Who's been to the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris? Many. Who's been to the Cathedral in Strasbourg? Okay, we'll stick with Notre Dame. When you go into Notre Dame, by the way, the same image is on the Cathedral of Trier, I, I discovered last year when I was in Trier. When you go into the cathedral, there are two statues on either side of the door, two twin sisters. They look exactly the same, except for some details. One sister is crowned, looks out with a clarity of vision, holds a mace of authority in her hand, confident. Her name is Ecclesia, Greek, church. Her twin sister has a crown that has fallen off. She's holding a mace that is broken, and most important of all, she is blindfolded. She doesn't see. What's her name? Synagoga. In the light of Vatican II, an oh, artist made this statue. Do you see Synagoga and Ecclesia? Now, who can tell me which one is synagogue and which one is ecclesia? Synagogue. She's holding the Torah scrolls. Ecclesia is holding the codex. This is the only distinction. They are twin sisters, both crowned, sitting in equality, looking at each other and studying the scriptures together a beautiful image of a new relationship. And I put it here to uh, illustrate. This is the fruit above all of biblical and theological studies, which before were the very source of the teaching of contempt. They killed Christ. They killed God. They are blind because they do not read the scriptures as we do. They do not see what we see. Okay, we continue. <clears throat> True, and again we come back to this because it's a part of scripture, a part of our story, something that we're constantly struggling with. True, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction, then alive nor against the Jews of today. Now, I have a feeling I might have said this story last time, but I'm going to tell it again because it's such a precious story. Anyone heard of Amos Oz? He is, uh, he's, he's passed now, but he's one of the greatest Israeli authors, world famous. If you haven't read his books, he has wonderful books. One of them, by the way, called Judas, which deal, deals with the Jesus story, a wonderful novel. Amos Oz, and I heard him tell this story many times. I was with him on different round tables, and he always told the story. Was on a train in Poland. And he was sitting in a train compartment, and suddenly two Roman Catholic sisters got in and sat opposite him. There was an old one and a young one. And he didn't speak any Polish, so he took out of his briefcase, a newspaper to read the newspaper, and it was in what language? In Hebrew. And he noticed that the young sister, her eyes were growing larger and larger. 
And finally, she couldn't restrain herself anymore. And she said to him, is that Hebrew? And he said, yes. And then she said, are you Jewish? And he said, yes, I am. And then she said, how could you do it? He was so sweet. <laughs> now it took him a few minutes to realize what she was asking him. And then he said, my sister, I had a dentist appointment that day. I didn't get there. <laughs> Again, it could have happened anywhere in the Catholic or Protestant world a hundred years ago. Okay, again, showing this change, this real radical transformation of how we talk. Although the church is the new people of God, and we affirm that in traditional Catholic theology, then comes the next part. The Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. Now again, that's not a simple statement to make, because we have atrocious texts in the Bible, in the New Testament, that might lead us to believe that they are cursed and rejected by God. So the church is really stepping out, realizing what our teaching of contempt has led to over centuries and saying it has to stop. Okay, and again, if anyone's interested, I've written quite a bit on how we now interpret the texts that before seemed so obviously to speak of the accursed state of the Jewish people. And by the way, someone who wrote quite a bit on this is no liberal in the history of the church, Benedict XVI, in his wonderful trilogy on Jesus of Nazareth, he's constantly dealing with these texts in order to neutralize them, take out the poison. All should see to it then that in catechetical work or in the preaching of the word of God, they do not teach anything that does not conform to the truth of the gospel and the spirit of Christ, meaning love, love for all. Furthermore, in her rejection of every persecution against any human person, the church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews, and moved not by political reasons, but by the gospel's spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time and by anyone. Short pass on that, notice, not by political reasons. There was concern already in the 60s, particularly from bishops coming from the part of the world that is mined by adoption, the Middle East, who were saying, can this now be exploited to support the state of Israel and everything that's going on? And so the church inserts there and will insist, we'll see, that the motivation here is not political. It is spiritual and religious. It is not to be mobilized for the support of any ideology. And finally, besides, as the church has always held and holds now, Christ underwent his passion and death freely because of the sins of men and women, and out of infinite love in order that all might may reach salvation. Now, here a wink, okay? We can say we wish that that's what the church had always held, but that's how the church introduces sometimes radical change. As the church has always held, we oppose slavery. Well, no, as the church has always held, it was Christ who entered into his death freely. And maybe one day there will be other radical changes introduced by as the church has always held. We continue. 
It is therefore the burden of the church's preaching to proclaim the cross of Christ as the sign of God's all-embracing love and as the fountain from which every grace flows. Again, we still have a long way to go in order to make sure that Jews see the cross as we see it. I remember when I was a young religious I came to visit my parents. My niece, who's now a grown woman, mother of a grown child, uh, I was playing with her. She was a student at King David, a pupil in King David. And she must have been about 12 or 13 at the time. And in playing with her, suddenly the cross that I had hidden inside my underclothes fell out. The look of horror on her face when she saw the cross made me vow that I'd never wear a cross again. And I don't. Because, of course, ah, the cross is seen by so many Jews, by so many Muslims we'll see at the end of the month, as a sign of persecution, crusade, discrimination. But, of course, we would desire that it would be seen as we see it, as a sign of God's all-embracing love and as the fountain from which every grace flows, we're not there yet. Okay, so again, I say I think this text is inspired. A number of people worked on it. Uh, it got an overwhelming yes from the Council Fathers. Let's look very briefly before we take some questions at... What is being said here? What are the main points? One, we share our roots with the Jewish people. How could we have ever forgotten that? And by the way, sharing our roots means that we have a lot in common. Despite all the obvious things where we differ, we speak a language that is fundamentally founded on the scriptures. We say so many words that both Jews and Muslims can understand. Two, Jesus is Jewish. Please notice that's not a grammar mistake. Jesus is alive, right? We would all agree to that. Okay? If Jesus is alive, it means he's Jewish. He didn't suddenly become a Catholic or a Protestant or an Orthodox. He is Jewish. Our God our Messiah, our Savior, is Jewish, as is his blessed mother. And of course, this is not something that unites us with the Jewish people, because the Jewish people mostly ignore Jesus. And if they do discuss him, they see him as the creator of many of their woes in history. But for us, we can never forget that Jesus is Jewish. Our tragic history... And our tragic history, for the most part, is in those places and those times when we as Catholics were the majority and Jews were a minority. Not everywhere, not always. There were golden times. One of the magnificent golden times of Jews living with Catholics was in Poland. For 200 years, called the Golden Age of Jewish life in Poland. Krakow was the center, and we're going back to the time when Poland offered refuge to Jews fleeing from more Western countries where there was persecution. This is still commemorated. Most Jews don't remember this. But in Hebrew, one says Poland, Polania. Sounds like Poland, right? But if you break it up, it means Po, here, lun, sleeps, ya, God. Security. For hundreds of years. That came crashing down when Poland suffered its own martyrdom at the hands of the Ukrainians in 1648-1649. But in too many places and at too many times, Jews bore the brunt of the teaching of contempt translated into terrible persecution, marginalization, and exile in many places. And of course, Jews know that history. We need to know it as well. 
which leads to a common front today. Uh, Pope Francis is eloquent about this, as was Pope Benedict, as was Pope John Paul II. We fight together, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Any contempt for the Jewish religion is foreign to the Catholic Church. Any contempt for Jews as Jews is foreign to the Catholic Church. Again, I'm speaking wish language. We want that to be so. I still hear homilies where I cringe. Okay? I hear homilies where Jesus is set against these nasty legalistic Pharisees. Yeah, the text seems to be saying that, but we can no longer vehicle that message because it's part of a long heritage of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. And finally, tikkun olam, a beautiful Hebrew expression which means repairing a broken world. We look around, we see a broken world. Huh. One of the most terrible breaks is right now what's going on in the Middle East. And we want to work together to repair a broken world. Tikkun, repair, olam, world. Repairing a broken world. It's not all smooth sailing. Challenges. And the challenges are enormous. And at this present moment, I share with you, we're in a time of crisis. In the dialogue between Jews and Catholics. Some of you might have seen the videos that are being circulated by the chief rabbi of South Africa, uh, Warren Goldstein. They are horrendous videos. Okay, Our institute last year responded to one of those videos. He's brought out a new one that is horrible. Yes, there are crises. There are moments where we need to say we don't agree. Okay, We need to sit down and talk. So these challenges... I mentioned, first of all, salvation. What do I mean when I say salvation is a challenge? Because we Christians think a lot about, is he going to, or she going to get into the kingdom of heaven? Are they going to go to paradise? Okay, it's a huge question. Again, I've written on this. Anyone interested, I can share with you the attempt to analyze post-Vatican II teaching about salvation and the Jews. We believe... Salvation is from the Jews. That's Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 22. When Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan, he says, salvation is from the Jews. Our big question is, and salvation for the Jews? Where is it from? Is it from Christ, not from Christ? How are Jews are saved? In our new teaching of respect, we need to do a lot more listening than speaking. Listening to Jews. Two. Israel, the state of Israel, okay? What is our position within the dialogue when it comes to the state of Israel? A very complex question when we realize that a huge number of Jews, Warren Goldstein and many, many other Jews, see themselves as intimately linked to a state and an ideology that created that state. We also recognize and I know here people of Lebanese origin, I'm not sure if the people here from Palestinian origin, that that state has created total havoc in the Middle East. Let's not mince our words as that havoc is increasing day by day. Okay, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, within the state of Israel, Lebanon and the surrounding region. What do we say? And for that reason, I want to share with you Something very clairvoyant that was uh, said by a later Vatican document. Of course, there are many documents after Nostra Aetate that continue to deal with the dialogue with the Jews. But I think that this is our position, at least minimally. Christians are invited to understand the Jewish religious attachment, which finds its roots in biblical tradition. That's the attachment to the land of Israel. Okay, many Jews, not all Jews by any manner of means, but many Jews say we are connected to that land. Okay, we need to hear that. And that is not problematic in and of itself. But we do not make our own any particular religious, rela uh, religious interpretation of this relationship. For us, we are hearing it. We can respect it. We do not say, oh, that's based on the Bible. 
Okay? That is not the way that we read the Bible. It continues, the existence of the state of Israel and its political options should be envisaged not in a perspective which is in itself religious, but in their reference to the common principles of international law. And I think that's essential. Okay? When we judge the state of Israel, we do not judge it from an anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish perspective. We do not judge it from a pro-Jewish, philo-Semitic perspective. We judge it according to the principles of international law. Okay? As we would any state. And Israel is no different from any state when it comes to that. Going back to our list of challenges, okay, the challenge of writing history. What do I mean? Do we write history as though we Catholics have always been saints? Okay, that every single Catholic was just an emulation of Jesus Christ? Thank God we're out of that period. <laughs> we are very critical about writing history as we should be. But the question here is, can we write history together with Jews? Can we create common textbooks, see their education? Can we educate our children with one united narrative? Admitting where we've gone wrong, being proud of where we've gone right, rather than having Catholics think everything was just hunky-dory and Jews thinking that everything was just one long valley of tears. No, there was complexity. And that complexity, as we sit down and work together, dialogue, understand, listen, speak also, we can come to some more united appreciation of who we are together on this journey which we must journey together. So, that is the presentation of the document. I'm going to slip one more slide so that you can see. Okay, we will welcome shortly David Lubinsky. I have asked him to prepare three questions. Who are you? Who are the Jews in South Africa today? Haven't said much about that. I think we should hear something. And could you share your thoughts on Nostra Aetate paragraph 4? Okay, interesting to hear. A Jews had time to reflect on the text that we just read. And then there will be time to pose any questions you want. Let's move into the second part. We have with us a guest who has repeated to me numerous times that I shouldn't have chosen him because there are so many other people who might do the job better. I chose this particular uh, a friend, Jewish friend, because I think that he has experience and intelligence, but also openness to really engage with us. So this is the motivation. Uh, um, as my mother said to him during the break, our families go back a long, long way. <laughs> and I'm not going to say too much about him because I really like him to introduce himself. You can see there behind him the three questions that I have posed to David, David Lubinsky, and we'll dive into it immediately. The first question is, who are you? And the question, of course, is that he gives a lengthy introduction to who he is and how he sees his own identity. Well, first of all, thanks a lot to David for inviting me and to you for giving me permission to talk about myself for a while, which I think is something we all love to do. So, yeah. All right, so I'm uh, turning 65 next week. And um, yeah, I've lived in South Africa most of my life, um, a little bit in the States. Um, I was born in 1959 and um, Grew up, I would say, a very typical Johannesburg suburban Jewish life. Um, I went to King David Victory Park, and after school I studied for a long time. I got a PhD in computer science and became a professor at WITS in computer science. Um, then afterwards I left 
the university and started a computer software company that I still run. Unfortunately, I wish I could retire, but <laughs> I can't yet. And um, I, I got married uh, when I was 25, and we had four children, whom I'll talk about a little bit later, because they're very relevant, I think, to the whole Jewish South African story. Uh, my wife's name is Debbie, and her, uh, her maiden name was Samson, and her brother David was very good with, uh, with David, and very good friends, I mean, and that's uh, the, our connection, and I'm very grateful to have met him. I, I find the times we spent together really valuable, and somehow peaceful as well. He helps my soul get restful a bit when I'm with him, so I like that. Um, so, yeah, so just a little bit about my life as it's situated within the Jewish community of South Africa. So, my grandfather came here from Lithuania. He was a refugee in the 20s. And that's a very common story for South African Jews. It's almost universal. Most of the Jews in South Africa have that history. Although there is a quite significant number of Jews who came from Germany before the war as well. And I think David's heritage is more from that side, as is my wife's. So my grandfather lived in Bronkospreit. He was general dealer there. He had the general dealer shop. And that's also a very common story of Jews who came to South Africa. They moved to small towns and started shops or other small businesses. And um, and my, my grandmother actually was, uh, she was, came here as an orphan. Um, there's a very famous story of, um, of orphans who were brought here from Ukraine after the Spanish flu. So a lot of Jewish orphans came to South Africa and she was one of them and, uh, yeah, and, and we came out of that heritage. So I think just also to situate the whole Jewish experience, I think it's important to understand as well that the people who came to South Africa from Lithuania, by and large, weren't very religious. I mean, they had strong Jewish ties, but more, I think it was the ties of a common oppression, I would say, that, you know, they escaped from Eastern Europe to escape the pogroms and the and the poverty, basically, they came to South Africa to try and make a better life. Actually, my grandfather came, he had first gone to America to relatives who, who lived in Kansas City in America, and they weren't able to support him. So he had an older brother who had come to South Africa before, and he was put on a ship at the age of eight all alone, and he came to South Africa to that older brother who looked after him. So he had basically you know, traveled the whole world before he was 10. Um, so it was a kind of difficult refugee life for them. But I think also what's, imp what's kind of important to know is, you know, it was also against the whole background of South African politics, where now from being the underclass of Jews in Eastern Europe, suddenly they were somehow part of the, you know, the dominant class of being white people in South Africa. And it was a a very big change and one that's still reverberating for us now. So I think, you know, I think the, the story of the generations of the Jewish community of South Africa is really, it's, it's an interesting one. You know, my father, who, um, who, who was also not religious at all, but also had a strong Jewish sentiment, so he was 19 years old when the State of Israel was formed in 1948. And he had a tremendous sense of Zionism. I think that whole generation was completely caught up in, first of all, the horrors of the Holocaust, and then somehow the birth and the tremendous hope that came out of the birth of the State of Israel. So he had a very strong Zionist feeling. I mean, he had a bit of a sad history. He went in 1948, straight after the formation of the State of Israel. So he joined a group called Hashomer HaTzair, which means the young gods, basically. They were a somewhat uh, communist or socialist kind of orientated group. Although my father wasn't like that at all. He was really not a political guy at all, but he was motivated very much, 
I think just by this being swept up in this whole idealism of Zionism. So he went to Israel, I think with the idea of fighting in the war. And, um, and the day he got there, um, he was asleep in the back of a bucky. The bucky uh, drove over, not a mine, but a little bump in the road. And he got thrown out of the back of the bucky. He got a, a broken jaw. And, uh, and he, he was then, you know, he, there wasn't really medical facilities there, so he was shipped back to South Africa, and uh, that was the end of the war for him, I suppose, luckily or not, but anyway. So that was just to give you an idea of the kind of fervor that uh, young Jews had at that time for Zionism and for Israel. Um, I don't know, some of you might have known him if you grew up in this area. He had the pharmacy just near the dam, not far from here, if any of you are from that area. His name was Max Lubinsky. <coughs> no, no recognition. <laughs> but anyway, I thought maybe someone might have known him. Anyway, so he, again, I, I think, um, you know, he was very close to his Judaism, but not in a religious way. I think in a very cultural kind of tribal way, almost, I would say. They, they sent myself and my sister to Jewish day school, to King David in Victory Park, where we were given a very, I'd say, typical Jewish upbringing for South Africa. Very strongly Zionist, but also very insular. You know, we were, um, we didn't really have much interaction with people who were not Jewish. Um, I think maybe what David asked me to talk a little bit about was how we perceived the Christian world at that time. And I think, you know, having grown up during and after the war, there was a tremendous kind of almost fear of the Christian world. You know, I think we felt very privileged to be growing up in a world that had not much anti-Semitism. There was some anti-Semitism that I'll mention. But there was always the sense that the Christian world's the sleeping bear you mustn't poke it too much, otherwise it's going to come back and attack you, you know? <laughs> and I, I mean, maybe some Jews still feel that way, or I think less so, you know? And so we felt like, uh, and I think I can speak quite generally about this, I think the Jewish community felt like we'll try and make our way quietly through South African life without rocking the boat too much and without being noticed too much. and. Uh, you know, I think it's, you can't really blame anyone for that. I mean, we were coming from a very particular and oppressive history, so the Jews had to really try and find a way that was, uh, you know, that wasn't making too much noise and just making as good a life as possible for ourselves. And I, I must say, I very much bought into that whole narrative. Um, my mom died when I was 14 years old. And that obviously had a huge impact on my life. And it, it made me start asking a lot of the same religious questions that people would ask when they faced with death. And being at King David, there were some quite charismatic rabbis there that started selling me on the whole orthodox path of Judaism. And so I bought into that for a long time. I became quite religious. I, wore a yarmulke, I kept kosher, I observed Sabbath, I learned Torah, and when I got married, we were pretty religious for a long time. So I went through a path of, uh, I'd say from the age of 15 to 35, being a pretty orthodox Jew, and so I've got a pretty fair amount of knowledge of orthodoxy and Jewish texts and so on, but I, the more I learned about it, I'm sorry to say, the less I could believe in it. So I've come out of the other side of it now as a, I don't know, an unconvert, you could call me. Or a, <laughs> or a, anyway, so, but I've still got a deep love for Jewish people, Jewish tradition, Jewish culture, and um, yeah, so I feel, I feel very closely Jewish. Um, part of my Jewish journey has been, there's this organization in Johannesburg called Limud, I don't know if anyone's heard of it. But anyway, Limud is a kind of more secular, maybe left-leaning kind of learning organization within the Jewish community. And I've been very involved with that. I've uh, given quite a lot of talks there. Um, 
The titles of my talks will give away 100% what my belief is. So the first talk was talking about Einstein's belief in God and spirituality, which I thought was quite important. First of all, because it's very fascinating, and second of all, because a lot of people try to appropriate Einstein as a kind of traditional religious person, which he definitely wasn't. Um, Einstein said once that his God was the God of Spinoza, which I didn't really understand, so I thought I'd better look that up. So <laughs> the next talk that I gave at Limud was talking about Spinoza's belief in God, <laughs> which, <laughs> which I, I'm sure, I don't know how many people have read Spinoza, it's not so easy, but if you do, you'll find, you know, he said God is nature, basically, which is sort of like saying God isn't anything. And, um, and so that was very interesting for me as well. Um, the third talk that I gave at Limud was uh, a more literary talk about there's been a whole lot of Jews who've left Orthodox Judaism and written books about it. I think Jews have a tremendous need to tell their stories. Like, I think like the Irish, the Irish also like that. And, <laughs> and like, um, anyway, so there's some books, some are good, some are less good, unfortunately. But anyway, I gave a talk sort of covering the span of all of those, uh, not all of them, a lot of those, uh, those memoirs about what it's like to move from being very orthodox to not being orthodox. And, you know, that was fun, people liked that. Uh, the last talk that I gave was called Lies My Rabbi Told Me, which... <laughs> um, that was all about, within the Jewish community, there's a, quite a strong, what they call the Kirov movement. Kirov means closeness. So it's a movement to try and bring people who are far from Judaism back into a more orthodox fold. So that movement in my opinion, and I think others as well, is not really all that respectful of truth. You know, they'll say things just in order to put a prettier coat over the whole, uh, the whole garment, let's say. And I, I don't think this is only in Judaism, I think it happens in a lot of religions, that you know, you get this kind of evangelical approach which is not very honest. So anyway, so I gave a talk about how I felt that this was a very destructive thing because first of all it hurts people's lives when you uh, when you you promise them things that are not true and second of all it degrades the whole religious offering because it makes it seem like if you were honest you wouldn't be able to attract people so you know I think it was two sides to the talk was one was if we love and respect our religion let's be honest about it and the other side was don't harm people by saying things that are not true, you know. So that, that was, I think, my most uh, well-received talk. But anyway, so that's a little bit about my background. And I'd like to tell a little bit about my children, because I think this movement of the generations is quite interesting, you know. That you had my grandfather, who was really a refugee, just struggling to make it. My father, who really had a nice suburban, comfortable lifestyle. I think myself, who I also did, but I was attracted back into my Jewish heritage a lot more. And then finally, so I've got four children. Um, one lives here, he's busy studying a master's at Wits. Um, there's one who's an artist who lives in Berlin. There's another one lives in Nairobi. He's busy becoming a yoga teacher, although his background was in uh, computer software development. And <laughs> the, the, the fourth one lives in Australia with two kids in Sydney. So she's the one who's followed the more normative path. So that's a, a little bit of my background, um, or maybe a lot. I'm not sure if I said too much or too little, David. David, for the sake of the people yes. here, because I think a lot of what you said was completely comprehensible, but maybe there was some in-language oh, that sorry needs about some that. passing. And I'm going to ask that you define in your own terms, yes. what does it mean when you say, uh, my father was very Zionist? What does that word mean? Yeah, okay. Thanks. I think that's a, a really good question, because what it meant to my father was very different to what it means now. You know, I think um, 
Zionism in the 50s and 60s was all about creating a haven for Jews. You know, the Jews had come out of the Holocaust and had this tremendous sense of never again. You know, this was the real rallying cry of Zionism, was let's create a state and a place where Jews can be safe. And I also think there was something a little bit messianic about it in the sense of building a new society that was somehow better, that was not going to be violent, that was not going to be oppressive, that was going to be inclusive. There was this real sense of after the Second World War, what can we build that's new? You know, that was the whole kibbutz movement. There, there was a lot of socialist, Marxist kind of thinking in that kind of thinking as well. So it was a very different kind of Zionism to what we see today, which is a kind of almost imperialist kind of racist movement, you know, which, so I'm pleased you said that because really the Zionism that my father felt and that's happening now are two very different things, you know. Thanks. David, I'm not sure if you would like to say something a little bit more structured about who are the Jews in South Africa? Yeah, I've got notes on that. <laughs> Thanks. So that's the next section. So as I mentioned, most of the Jews in South Africa are descended from uh, Eastern Europeans, mostly Lithuanians. And it's a very interesting community because I think the Jews in South Africa have had a really disproportionate contribution to South African society in business, arts, um, academia. And I think have played a fundamentally important role. Even interestingly enough, in the whole act, you know, anti-apartheid activism world, there were a lot of Jews who, again, disproportionately contributed there. Um, so, but the Jewish community in South Africa is unfortunately in decline. I think at the peak, the community was close to 150,000 people. It's now declined to around 60,000, and. Under 50. Maybe under 55, no. okay. The statistics that were just released on Rosh Hashanah said the community is 49,500. Wow, okay. Countrywide. Countrywide. Yeah. Well, of course, if you go to Sydney, New York, London, <laughs> you'll find lots of, <laughs> you'll find, uh, lots of South African Jews there. So, I mean, so looking at a community in decline is, is an interesting thing. I mean. The Jewish um, institutions are still very strong, you know, I think there's, uh, there's an institution called the Hebra Kedisha, which means holy community, who do with things, deal mainly with looking after the poor of the community. So I think, you know, you'll always get support. The Hebra Kedisha will always look after any poor Jews, you know. Jews are not going to be allowed to starve or not have uh, accommodation or anything. So I, I think from that point of view, it's a tremendously strong community. The schools are still running well. I mean, there's more Jewish schools in Johannesburg than there need to be, maybe eight if you count all together. And that's including the Orthodox ones. Um, there's also there's a, a newish institution called Hatsona, which you might have heard of. Hatsona is an basically an ambulance uh, service that supplements the government ambulance, a very, very wonderful set of people who provide all kinds of medical facilities, all for free, you know, all voluntary, it's really amazing. So the old age care is also very good within the community. So it's a very insular community, but very strong in its support. I mean. Philosophically, obviously, there's a broad range of, of, uh, of beliefs across the community. I think this, this sense of decline of the community has also called the, caused the community to go a little bit into a survival mode where it's kind of, you know, become more and more insular. You know, it's more and more inward looking and uh, in order to just keep itself safe, I suppose. But, um, yeah, I think... I think the, I don't know how much cross there is between the Jewish community and the Christian community, not that much, I don't think. I think it's still very much inward looking. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. A third question, and then there'll be time to pose questions and make comments, so please think about that. 
David, um, before you came here, I asked that you would have a look at this Vatican document mm. that is for us a revolution. Uh, we are marking 60 years since its publication in uh, 1965. Next year we'll mark 60 years. And we have just spent an hour reading it through carefully. And I wondered whether you could give us your impressions as a Jew reading that document, um, your comments and your critiques of what you read. Sure. Thanks, David. So I have printed it out here with a few of my comments. Um, so, first of all, of course, as a Jew or anyone who's not Catholic, you must obviously welcome this kind of document that attempts to heal the rifts and the difficulties between the communities. Um, I'm glad to hear you say that there have been subsequent documents because there are some real problems with it still. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, um, I guess, uh, you know, I, I suppose as a Jewish person you'd say, well, finally, you know, I mean, it's like, why is it that it's taken so long to get here? You know, it seems like, for me, you know, I don't know that much about Christianity in general or Catholicism in particular, but it, it seems like the whole philosophy, the driving force of Christianity is one of love, of acceptance, of caring, but yet somehow there was always this huge, I don't know, like a contradiction in the way that Jews and others were treated, you know. When we were at school, basically we were taught about the Crusades and the Inquisition. That was basically what we knew about Christianity, you know. So, <laughs> it, was, so it was basically, I'm not sure you agree, like we went through a similar schooling, yes. <laughs> And I mean, the idea was from this point of view that Christianity is not something, a positive force in the world, but basically a negative force to be quite scared of, you know. And so it's, um, it's obviously a wonderful thing that these kinds of things are happening. But I suppose, the, you know, I, th I think that if you look at this fourth paragraph, the whole theme of it seems to be that Jews and Christians are somehow brothers in the whole spiritual path through life. And it doesn't really tackle the issue of how do we reconcile these opposing truths, you know, because they are opposing, they're not really easily reconciled. So I think it's a little bit too optimistic in that way about, you know, it sort of glosses over the really tough problem of how do we live? We can't, I think, I don't know, there's a famous uh, Jewish rabbi called Samson Hirsch. I don't know if people have heard of him, some might have. Anyway, he had this parable of the golden rings that, um, you know, each people is given a ring and they all look like gold, but most of them are fake, only one is real. So we all have to act as if our golden ring, which is our faith system, is the real one because. We can't really tell which is the real one. So <laughs> I kind of, uh, when I first heard that, I thought, how wonderful, you know, how ecumenical. We all got the same position. But it's, it's actually a real cop out, that way of thinking. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not a good way of thinking, you know. We have to evaluate our belief systems and try and find what is the best way. And I think it's very difficult to reconcile. And I don't really think this document takes us along that path at all. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's, uh, that's one of my reactions to it. Um, I think, you know, I think personally one of the reasons why there's been such animosity between Christians and Jews is it's this natural animosity of trying to reject where you came from, you know, children have to reject their parents' belief systems and and in order for Christians to be fully in, sort of embracing of their own faith, they had to somehow reject their origin faith. And I think this document tries somehow to correct that, to say, no, we have to embrace where we came from and not reject that. And I like that a lot, you know, although it's a very hard thing to do. Um, 
I think for me, the biggest kind of red flag was the sentence that, um, if I could just read it. It says, True, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all Jews without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jews of today. So, I mean, that's like an incredible sentence, as if it's got any lack of obviousness, you know. How could you even think that what happened 2,000 years ago, 10,000 kilometers away, is somehow meaningful in terms of us who came from Eastern Europe, who more westernized than, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of, it kind of belies the whole idea that Jews are not being, uh, you know, picked out for special treatment or contempt or, you know, so I think that was just for me a very jarring sentence, you know. The next sentence also, although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. Again, and I think this whole idea of the new people of God is also it's very hard to reconcile with what we mean by the old people of God, you know. Uh, yeah, thank you. you. You said exactly that. When I came in. Yeah, I think I've, I've discussed this point about really trying to make Jewish and Christian belief somehow co-equal. I think it's, it's a really, I think if we're going to be honest, we have to really try and approach how we're going to, you know, raise up one belief against the other, but still have respect for the other belief. And I think that's a really tough journey to go on. You know, I mean, I know that Orthodox Jews certainly don't have any idea of respecting Christian theology. And that's a great pity because there needs to be ways to be found where Orthodox Jews and Christians can see each other as co-believers, you know, I mean, like I'm not religious at all anymore, but I see people who are religious as really having an idealistic view of the world, trying to improve the world, trying to live their lives in the most spiritual, best way possible, you know, and I think it would it really be good if they could see each other as as allies in this project of trying to build the best world together. You know, I'm, I'm really not too sure how that's going to happen. So, yeah, I mean, I think just the sentence, furthermore, in a rejection of every persecution against any man, the church, mindful of the patrimony she shares with the Jews, and moved not by political reasons, but by the gospel spiritual love, decries hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed at Jews at any time and by anyone. I mean, to me, this is also just a horrible sentence because it completely ignores, you know, the not exactly, you know, the thousand years of real hatred and violence and damage done by the Jew, by the church against Jews, you know. So, I mean, there is the implication of some apology lying underneath this, but this broad kind of sentence that just, you know, it's as if the church has always been, you know, moved, not, you know, it's just been full of God's spiritual love. It's, it's, there's a real issue there to deal with. And I feel like this document doesn't go there at all, which is, for me, quite a big problem. So, yeah, I think... Maybe I'll raise one more problem, <laughs> if that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, I think this last paragraph, um, it says, Besides, as the church has always held and holds now, Christ underwent his passion and death freely, because of the sins of men and out of infinite love, in order that all may reach salvation. It is therefore the burden of the church's preaching to proclaim the cross of Christ as the sign of God's all-embracing love and as the fountain from which every grace flows. So, somehow this seems to be saying that evil as the Jews were, they were somehow God's tool in creating this destiny. You know, so <laughs> this idea of, of some, you know, predestined kind of movement through history, through some evil tools, is a really dangerous one in my idea, you know. I've heard it, unfortunately, even being said in the Jewish world that 
although the Nazis were so evil, that somehow led to the creation of the Israeli state, which was seen as you know, a very important part of Jewish kind of redemption. And for me, that kind of philosophy is sickening, you know. It's really deeply disturbing to talk like that, but it is said by people. And again, this strikes me also, you know, you can't go and forgive evil just because it's somehow helping God to achieve the, the historical destiny that we need. So again, I don't really like that sentence very much. But <laughs> anyway, but I don't want to, I mean, I'm just, you know, responding because you asked me to. And, um, <laughs> and overall, like I said in the beginning, a very, you know, I think all Jews and all people should be very happy and welcoming of this kind of approach and the subsequent documents, which I'm not familiar with, but that you mentioned. Okay, thanks. So David, I'm going to send out to everyone here, and I'll send it to you as well, the most recent documents, although I did say this morning we are nowhere near the end of the journey. Uh, we are still on the way. And what we are celebrating is that we've actually started the way. Uh, and as you can hear, there are still many, many questions. Part of the challenge is to listen. I listen to Jewish people their experience, but also reflecting on our own way of speaking. So, you said that you were not appropriate. Uh, I beg to differ 180 degrees. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. No, it's a pleasure.